Welcome to this latest edition in our series here at iConnect called Five Questions. Five questions that we pose to a public law scholar about his or her work. My name is Richard Albert, and I'm co-editor of iConnect, along with Tom Ginsberg and David Landa. Our guest today for our edition on Five Questions is David Kenny, Assistant Professor at Trinity College Dublin, a graduate of Trinity and also of Harvard Law School. David, thank you for doing this. Thank you, Richard. Great to be here. So let's start. What are you writing and researching right now? So at the moment, I'm working on a few sort of similar papers uh, that kind of delve into some critical methodological questions about comparative constitutional law. So I'm just finishing up a paper about constitutional culture and the problems of trying to account for uh, the phenomenon of cultural understandings in comparative constitutional law. And I think that throws up some methodological obstacles that will be interesting for the discipline to confront. So trying to finish up that paper at the moment. I'm also writing a paper about constitutional disagreement, uh, essentially arguing that constitutions can and maybe should be um, unprincipled bargains uh, when they need to take account of disagreement. So maybe that uh, constitutions are pragmatic rather than theoretically coherent documents. So those are two papers I'm working on at the moment, and those are hopefully both related to uh, a book project in its early stages uh, about the problems uh, with theory and principle in comparative constitutional law, uh, which again touches a lot upon methodological questions and, and how we should approach questions in the discipline. So a few related projects going on at the same time. Hmm. Big inquiries that you're, you're getting into. I look forward to reading uh, your papers and, and the book when it's published. Um, so how and when do you write, David? Do you have a particular routine in the morning, afternoon, evening, or, or do you just write whenever the time comes to you? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a cliche, but I have no routine. Uh, I write whenever I can between other tasks, sort of, you know, flitting between different projects sometimes. Uh, it can be at home on the couch at home, sort of here in, in more of an office-like environment. But mostly, I think my best writing gets done in my office in, in uh, Trinity College or in the library there, mostly because I struggle not to get distracted at home. There are other things going on here. There are other things to do. And so I find that's where I get my, my, best, my best work done. I also find that, obviously, my, like many people, my best writing is done when I have real focus on a project, when something's really gripping and consuming me or when I have a tight deadline that I'm str struggling to meet. And so I find that um, uh, often even the busiest times can be times when I get some of my best writing done and uh, sort of unstructured time uh, can be good for big thinking and so on, but actually getting the writing done in that time can bizarrely be more of a struggle. So I'm definitely one of those people that has to do it whenever I can. Uh, I'd love to develop a routine. I'd love to be one of those people who can set aside time every morning or every evening, but I find that's not as efficient for me as doing it this way. Maybe someday I'll, I'll be a bit more organized about it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you write in, uh, in the library at Trinity. There's a beautiful library there, the, the Long Room uh, Library, isn't it? One of the most beautiful I've seen in my, in my life. Is that where you yeah, are? One of the most beautiful libraries in the world. Yeah, unfortunately, don't always get to access that for our own work as you know, tourists need to see it and so on. But the other libraries in uh, Trinity are also very pleasant to work in and we have a great staff there. So we don't always get the, the, the absolute best, but still very good facilities. So uh, uh, David, when did you know that this is what you wanted to do, that you wanted to be a law professor, a scholar of law? Yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's hard for me sometimes to remember when exactly I made the decision. I think my first uh, actually class in law school, um, I was taught by an amazing uh, Irish constitutional scholar who's gone on to be a judge now of the, the European Court of Justice, it's called Jared Hogan, and he was an amazing and inspiring teacher of constitutional law. And I think at the back of my mind, I always thought I would love to be able to, to do what he did. And I'm not sure at that stage in my first year, I really thought that that was something I, I could do or would do. But then later, um, when I was studying in the US, I had a similar experience being taught by Lawrence Tribe, who I also found to be a really amazing and inspiring teacher of constitutional law. And what I found with both of those um, uh, professors was that they could sort of bring you up to sort of a different level during their classes. And maybe you never fully 
came back down. You kind of retained a little bit of their mode of thinking and the way they explain things. And I think those were such fantastic experiences for me that at some point during my time in the US, I decided I would definitely try to do this. This would be my primary career path and I, I would see if it were possible. Um, but really, I think almost from the very start of law school, I probably had some sense that if I could manage it, this would be a career I'd love. And luckily, as I went on to my doctorate and, and starting to teach, I found that I loved all the individual elements and, and I really enjoyed being a scholar because I think when I made those initial decisions, I probably didn't know a lot about what it actually entailed. And that's something you have to figure out as you get into it, I think. You have the great privilege, of course, of teaching where you were a student. Yes, and it's so uh, gratifying to, to try to replicate the experience. I teach the same first, first year constitutional law course that Jared Hogan taught me. And I don't think I necessarily can do as good a job as he did. But I think that the opportunity to try and inspire students in the same way, uh, that's one of the things that I uh, uh, enjoy most about my job and that, that student interaction. And it's also great to have that connection with a university and see how it changes, but also hopefully how the things that you value stay the same. And you also have the privilege of teaching from your own casebook, which is the leading casebook on Irish public law. Yeah, we write a, a book called uh, Kelly, the Irish Constitution, and it's used by judges and practitioners and academics and students. And so it has a, uh, a really wide audience and is regularly cited in the Supreme Court, as well as being a, a really useful sort of uh, um, student text as well. So it's a great privilege to, to write that book. And, and one of my co-authors is um, Jared Hogan, that, that judge that I referred to earlier. So a great privilege to work with him and, and two other excellent co-authors on, on that work. David, let, let's go back to when you were a student. Was there an article or, or a paper or a book at the time that really moved you, influenced you, touched you then, yeah. that continues today still to resonate with you and your work? Yeah, I think that it's a couple that I might mention. So when I was an undergrad, I read um, Akhil Amar's American Constitution, a biography, which um, was really uh, inspiring for me because it was a very different uh, style of scholarship than perhaps we were sometimes used to in the European um, and common law uh, English legal education tradition, which Ireland often adopts as well. And I found that that was really um, eye-opening for me in terms of the breadth of uh, political science and history that really could and should be coming into public law scholarship. And it inspired me to sort of um, uh, want to study in the US and to pursue my legal education there. And then later on, as, a, as an undergraduate student, um, I read... Uh, two other books that really sort of stuck with me. One was Duncan Kennedy's Critique of Adjudication, which, uh, again, for being so different and so uh, uh, unusual for me at the time and its perspective, uh, really stayed with me, and I find myself dipping into it from time to time. And one other book, uh, when I was a, a master's student, we were um, asked to read one article or one chapter from a Stanley Fish book, a collection of essays called There's No Such Thing as Free Speech and It's a Good Thing Too. And I remember reading the essay and being so taken with it that I think I read the whole rest of the book in a day, even though it wasn't on our course. And I still find myself returning to, to, to that book from time to time. And I, I often would use ideas from theorists like Stanley Fish in my own work. So that was uh, influential then and, and continues to be an influence to this day, I think. And, and now what about your work as we close this interview, which I thank you again for agreeing to do. Um, is there one paper or chapter or, or, or book that you'd like to share with us as being one of your most important so that we can link that on the blog to our readers and they can learn more about you and, and about your work? Yeah, I, I think it's very hard, obviously, to pick one. It's like picking between your, your children. They're all sort of special in their own way. And um, the one I think I would select as, as my favorite, at least at the moment, is one of my most recent papers from the American Journal of Comparative Law. And it's about uh, the proportionality test, this famous test in comparative public law. And it sets out a comparative critique of that test, but also um, it's a methodological statement, again, about sort of, you know, some of the 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 ways we could inquire into the, the discipline of comparative constitutional law in a, a new way that I think could expose some new aspects of it. So because that paper sort of combines a topic that I enjoy studying in proportionality, but also is part of this broader methodological project that I'm undertaking, uh, I think that's the one I'm, I'm most fond of, at least at the moment. Well, thanks for highlighting that one. And as I say, we'll link to it 
uh, when we publish this interview on the blog so that our readers can, can have a better sense of what it is you're thinking about and writing about. But David, thank you very much for, for making time for this. Uh, I'm really grateful personally, and, uh, and I'm sure that our viewers will, will appreciate learning more about you. So thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. It was a pleasure. Bye.